Are you looking to feel and perform better? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to the Neutralize Podcast, where you'll learn how to use evidence-based interventions for enhanced cognitive performance. All right, welcome to the Neutralize Podcast once again. Today we are chatting with Mind Pump Sal, Sal Stefano, who is the host of the top 10 ranking podcast in the health and fitness category worldwide. Uh, so Sal Stefano is an entrepreneur, podcast host, and personal trainer. So we'll be talking about how you can get most out of your exercise in the least amount of time and also how you can optimize your exercise to get the most rewards in terms of cognitive performance from your exercise. So let's get straight into it. All right. Thank you, Sal Stefano, for coming on the Neutralize podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. To start with, I'm interested how, in your opinion, then does one get the most results from their exercise in the least amount of time? Okay, so um, that's a common question. People want to know how they can maximize their results and minimize the amount of time uh, you know, spent in the gym or time spent working out. In other words, they're looking for maximum efficiency. This is right. actually a great question because um, one of the biggest challenges that we face in modern times really has to do with the fact that we're very inactive, but we're also very busy. So it's not like we're inactive and we have all this open space. We tend to fill our time with uh, work or other commitments, school, um, our children. And so inactive, but also very busy. So this is actually the question that you just asked me is something that I think the fitness space needs to answer uh, very effectively if we are going to um, tackle the chronic health problems that we're seeing now in modern societies, which include, of course, obesity, which is a, a side effect of uh, you know the, the, our lifestyle, and then all of the obesity-related uh, chronic um, illnesses, um, you know, heart disease and diabetes, Alzheimer's, uh, very, very strongly connected. Um, a very good chunk of cancers now are connected, we're finding now, are connected to um, our, our, our lifestyle, which includes obesity. But then we also have lots of chronic illnesses that aren't even connected to obesity that we're seeing on the rise, autoimmune issues and, uh, and the like. So, um, Great question. Okay, so number one, context matters uh, in the sense of, well, what are you looking for? What are your goals? So I'm going to have to speak very generally here because uh, my answer can vary depending on who I'm speaking to. If I'm speaking to an athlete, someone who's very advanced, someone who wants to get a, you know as strong as possible, someone who just wants to improve their health. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, when we're talking about improving health, again, we have to consider modern life. We don't move much. These are the two big problems right here. We don't move much because life is very, uh, it's just designed that way. You, you wake up, you get in your car, you sit down at work, you get back in your car, you're at home. You know, in the past, life was naturally active. Uh, you had to be active just to do your job or wash your clothes or, or get your food or walk to the, to the store. So it's, uh, it's, it's very inactive just naturally. Number two, food is extremely uh, available. It's very, very available. It's very inexpensive. Markets have done a phenomenal job of making food, energy-dense food, uh, so in other words, high-calorie food, uh, available to most people for very low cost. And food is also, because of this, we have uh, access to pretty much any flavor or experience um, that we're looking for with food. I mean, I, I here I I'm in I'm in California, and um, uh, within ten minutes of where I'm located, I could get Chinese food, Mexican food, Italian food, uh, or I could go on my phone and get on an app and order a burger, a hot dog, pizza, or you know chicken uh, or you know teriyaki chicken. So those are the two big problems: very inactive but busy, uh, so we don't have a lot of time and uh, lots and lots of food, easily accessible, and it tastes really good. So in that context, what you want to find with exercise is you want to find a type of working out that uh, doesn't require as much time as other forms of exercise to yield results, and a form of exercise 
that increases your base metabolic rate, your metabolism. A faster metabolism is a, a wonderful insurance policy in modern life. It was a, a fast metabolism in the past was probably a bad thing. You know, if you go back a thousand years, um, it probably made it didn't make any sense to have a metabolism that was very inefficient, just burning tons of calories because food mm -hmm. was hard to come by. Today, the opposite is is true. If you're if you have a very efficient metabolism, your the odds that you'll be obese um, are are higher, right? You want to be able to burn things off just naturally uh, through metabolism that's much faster. So we want a form of exercise that doesn't take as much time, speeds up the metabolism. Hands down, there is no form of exercise in that context that can compare to resistance training, uh, lifting weights. Mm -hmm. Lifting weights sends a signal to the body to build muscle. Muscle on its own burns more calories. It's a very active tissue. Um, in other words, it requires uh, a lot of calories uh, just to support it. But also, resistance training causes uh, or, or tells the body to be less efficient with calories. So what we find in studies is or at least what I found in my experience, I'll just speak from experience, I'll train a client, uh, we'll do resistance training, and they may gain a couple pounds uh, of muscle on the scale. So two pounds of muscle on the scale, you are not, you don't look any bigger or more muscular, but you feel tighter. The muscles feel tighter, the body feels more toned, uh, and so it's typically a, a desirable thing. But you're not gaining tons of weight. Two pounds of muscle spread out over the whole body is not that much. Now, on a, on a calorie burn basis, those two extra pounds may burn an additional, uh, you know, depends on the study you look at, you know, 50 to 100 calories a day just to support it. doesn't sound like much, but of course, over the course of a year, that makes a big difference. But what, what we also find is that the, the sending the signal to build muscle also simultaneously tells the body to become less efficient with calories. And so what you find is you just get a much higher calorie burn all the time. So... That same client who only gained two pounds, if I simultaneously slowly increase their caloric intake or do, you know, have the meat in a way that promotes uh, inefficiency with metabolism, so promotes a faster metabolism, I'll get that client to, to be able to consume 300 to 400 more calories a day. This was, this was quite common without gaining any, addi any additional weight. Now, 300 calories, 400 calories, that's equivalent to an hour, two hours of moderate cardiovascular activity. So instead of having to do one and a half hours or two hours of cycling on a bike, I'm just burning that many more calories just sitting here being myself. And that's what resistance training can do. So the, the, the sh the, that's the long answer. Here's the short answer. Lift weights, focus on compound movements, barbell squats, deadlifts, uh, overhead presses, bench presses, rows, traditional strength building exercises. Focus on getting stronger. Do this, you know, for the average person listening who's just looking for better health. Two days a week, you could get exceptional results with about two days a week, 30 to 45 minutes focusing on those exercises. If your goals are a little bit uh, higher and you want to build a little bit more muscle and sculpt the body a little more, three days a week. And you can go very far uh, just with that. Hmm. So assuming someone is a complete beginner, how does he or she efficiently get the right technique with these compound movements? Another great question. Uh, the drawback, I would say, the, 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 the Achilles heel of resistance training is the perceived uh, complexity of, uh, of, of, of doing that form of exercise. And I say perceived because I think when we look at like, when we think to ourselves, I'm just going to go outside and run. That's going to be my form of exercise. It doesn't seem to be that complex. The reality is running is also very, a very complex form of exercise. Um, and people typically run terribly, which is why it's got such a high injury rate. Um, but to be fair, resistance training just is, has a lot of variables. There's, uh, you know, off the top of my head, I can name 50 exercises in the next 30 seconds if I wanted to. And I could also name two or three variations of each of those exercises. So that can seem quite overwhelming to the average person. Like, how do I get started? So what I would recommend somebody do is, uh, number one, when you're looking at, uh, at your, your resistance training workout, don't think of it as a workout and think of it as practicing skills. It's a very different mentality. It makes a huge difference 
in terms of long-term success. We've been taught that, or, or, or we've been led to believe that working out, uh, what consists, uh, you know, what, what constitutes a, an effective workout has to do with how sweaty I am, how hard it is, and how sore I get. Hmm. Um, that, unfortunately, that message uh, causes people to go out and aim for those things. And because of that form, technique, effectiveness goes out the window. It's all about those, those types of things. So forget about that for a second. Forget about sweating and soreness and tired and all that stuff. And just think, I'm going to learn and I'm going to practice this skill. Okay, so that's number one. There's your mentality. Here's number two. There's only a few exercises that you need to practice to get started. Practice squatting. Um, you could start with no weight whatsoever and then slowly progress yourself to where you're holding weight or putting weight on your back. So squatting, number one. Uh, number two, practice some form of a deadlift or a hip hinging exercise. So if you've never seen a deadlift, it's, uh, it's the way that you've been taught to lift things properly. So when people say, oh, when you pick something up heavy off the ground, use your legs and, and throw your hips back and keep your back straight. That's kind of like what a deadlift is. So deadlifting, that's another exercise you'd want to practice. Practice some form of a horizontal press. Push-ups or bench press would be an example of that. And then practice some form of a row. So a cable row, if you don't have exercise to any uh, cables, you could do a barbell row or a body row so where you're like an inverted position. You pull your body to a bar. Uh, some parks will have these bars that you can do this on. They're like, they look like low you know, pull-up bars or whatever. Um, some form of an overhead press. This is where you pick something up over your head. Approach those basic fundamental movements. I only named a few. So it's the deadlift, the squat. Uh, some kind of a press, some kind of a row, and some kind of an overhead press. It's five exercises. That's it. Practice those movements at like skills, like you're trying to do them perfectly, and you're trying to do this in ways where they don't hurt your body in bad ways and you feel good. As you practice those movements over time, you can increase the intensity as you get better at them. Now, if you need uh, more instruction and information, which many people do, um, one of the best investments somebody can make is uh, in hiring a, a personal trainer, a good personal trainer. And you don't necessarily need to work with someone for very long. You can hire somebody for maybe eight sessions, which would give you a month of two days a week of instruction. And within that month, you should be able to, um, you know, barring any, any major functional movement issues or, or muscle, you know, recruitment pattern issues or, or injuries, you should be able to learn uh, basic skills with those exercises that I just taught. So eight, eight workouts, two a week for the next four weeks. If that's out of somebody's price range, because personal training can be expensive, although extremely valuable. So if it is your price range, there's nothing you'll get that'll be more valuable than that. But let's say that's still too expensive. You can go online. Luckily today we have access to so much uh, free information. Um, I, for example, have a, a channel on YouTube, Mind Pump TV, and we have instructions on those exercises that I listed plus many many more because we're all personal trainers with decades of experience we teach them uh, in in effective ways in other words we teach them in ways where it's easy to understand um, and uh, and then if you want to invest in a program an online program uh, where there's somebody kind of teaching you uh, we offer those as well at, at mind pump media uh, or excuse me maps fitness products I should say dot com um, and these are products that we sell that you can enroll in and follow. But you don't even have to do that. I think if you go on YouTube and you treat the exercises like practice um, and you take your time, uh, within a few months you'll start to be, feel comfortable enough to really push uh, the workout. So I, I, that's where I would say I would start, about five exercises. Hmm. That's really practically useful. I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. So if your goal with exercise is to improve your cognitive performance and mental health. How should you exercise in your opinion? So um, when you're looking at cognitive health, we, I think we tend to forget that the brain is a part of the body. Um, mm. So we think, you know, oh, I'm going to do this thing or take this thing that's good for my brain as if it were separate from the rest of your body. And so what, the reason why I'm saying that is whatever is going to make you generally healthier and more vibrant is going to contribute to cognitive function uh, positively, um, more so than anything that you could do or take that's maybe a, st a stimulant or something that will 
you know, that you can augment or biohack general overall health. I mean, if we were to compare, if we were to take a study and take a bunch of very unhealthy people, terrible diets, bad sleep, no exercise, and had them exercise and eat right and get good sleep and compared them to a control group that did none of that and that just took, you know, stimulants or, or supplements or biohack, we would see that the people who just did this stuff to improve their health would have far better uh, cognitive improvements. So, so you want to just be healthier. But if we're going to break it down further and look at, okay, what forms of exercise, okay, we know now that just being healthy, getting good sleep, eating properly, and being active, those things will contribute the most to good cognitive performance. Now let's break it down even further. Okay, what form of exercise, what type of foods, um, and how should I sleep to maximize those things? So we'll start with sleep. Uh, number one, um, if you're getting, we're going to, we're going to pretend that you get, you know, adequate sleep. So cause that's number one, right? If you're not getting enough sleep, get more sleep. That's going to make a huge impact. But if you're getting adequate sleep, you're getting your seven or eight hours at night. How do I make my sleep, uh, more effective because sleep quality is the other part of the equation. It's not just the amount of time you're actually sleeping, but how good is your sleep? One of the best things that I've ever, uh, experienced or, or seen with clients was to have a sleep uh, prepare a, a preparedness sleep routine. So um, it's okay. So think of it this way: Let's say you're an athlete. You're going to go play uh, a very big game. You're probably not going to just jump off the couch and go play the game. You're probably going to have a good hour of warm up. You know, priming movements. You know, watching. Um, you know, maybe some tape on the team that you're going to play you know, verb, uh, a mental visualization to prepare yourself for the game, right? That, that's, that's a, I think, a pretty common thing. Most people understand that. But when we, when we go to bed, I think we expect to just go to sleep and have good sleep. So we're on our computers, on our phones, lights are on real bright. Okay, everybody, time to go to bed. And then I shut everything off and then lay down and expect my brain to be ready for high-quality sleep. Well, it doesn't necessarily work that way. The way we evolved was to have this gradual uh, process of getting ready for sleep. And, and that gradual process was the sun. You know, you're outside, the sun is out, it's bright. Sun starts to set, slowly starts to get darker, and then eventually it gets very dark. Of course, humans are not nocturnal creatures, so we predators were out at night. They could see very well. We were pretty blind in the evening, so lights went, you know, the sun went down, and, and we went in our cave, and we maybe had some firelight, and then we went to sleep. So the brain really evolved to go through that process. It's not. Uh, it's it's far better to go through a slow unwinding period. So, what I'd recommend to to, to my clients was about two hours before bed, uh, start preparing yourself for sleep. So one of the best ways to do this is to dim the lights uh, in your home and then turn the lights off. Use candlelight, or you can use uh, low ambient, you know, like a Himalayan salt lamp light. Um, you could start, uh, you know, doing things that will bring down your, your level of aroused, you know, how aroused you are. So you're not having loud conversations. You start to talk a little softer. You start to move a little slower. You can maybe put on some slippers. You can mentally prepare yourself for sleep. Um, wear blue light blocking glasses if you're going to be on electronics. Um, if you are going to be on electronics right up until the time you go to sleep, you can buy, buy some very, very powerful Blue light and green light blocking glasses. They tend to be red in color, um, uh, but they do make a big difference. And then you'll find a higher quality of sleep. Okay, so now let's talk about diet. When it comes to diet, uh, a balanced diet uh, that consists of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats from whole food natural sources is probably the best go-to. That being said, uh, some people do find cognitive improvements when they put their bodies into a state of ketosis, this is where the they avoid carbohydrates, they increase their fats, and then their body and uh, and, and and their brain starts to run off of uh, of of, of uh, ketones, which are uh, produced off of fats. And when you lack uh, glucose or carbohydrates in your diet, um, now whether this is cognitive boost for everybody is is a little bit up in the air. But we do know that people with cognitive impairment Impairment, excuse me, do tend to show pretty pretty good boosts in uh, in cognitive uh, performance from going. So I think people with like 
dementia and Alzheimer's, they seem to perform much better when they're on a, on a, on a ketogenic diet. Um, but really it's about just eating unprocessed, whole natural foods and not overeating. Um, high calorie context, even with healthy foods, um, can start to cause problems um, for some people. All right, now let's get to the workout part. This is where I like to spend most of my time because this is where most of my expertise, expertise lies. Mm-hmm. Um, of all of the forms of exercise that will boost cognitive performance, aside from the health boosting effects, right? So we know that working out, re- being active just improves your, your overall health. Now let's look at exercise from a brain development or challenge standpoint, right? So there's a term in fitness uh, that we use called uh, proprioception or proprioceptive ability. This is your, 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 your brain and body's ability to know where it is in space. So to give you an example of a person with an incredible, with incredible proprioceptive ability, um, this would be like a, a, an Olympic diver, right? Somebody who jumps off of a diving board, spins and backflips, and they know where they are in space so well that they can actually finish the dive uh, headfirst into the pool. I mean, if you threw me up there and spin me around like that, I'd have no idea where I was. Uh, until I, you know, hit the water and stop spinning. So that's proprioceptive ability, and that requires a lot of brain activity. Um, you also want to look at the, the, the exercise and how, it, how much it requires you to be present and conscious, okay? So how much, how conscious and present do I have to be, be in order to do this uh, physical activity? So let's say I'm walking on a treadmill. Well, when I first get on the treadmill... I'm pretty conscious, pretty present, and actually paying attention to what I'm doing. But after about 10 minutes, uh, it's, it's, I'm just moving. You know, I, I'm, I'm on autopilot, my legs are moving, and I'm thinking about other things. You can't do that with resistance training. With resistance training, you're conscious the entire time. You're present is what I, should, what I mean, the, the entire time. Every rep, I'm paying attention. I can't just go on automatic mode while I'm squatting and deadlifting and bench pressing and overhead pressing. If I did, I'd hurt myself. So it's a very, you have to be very present because of the angles involved. I'm not just moving in one motion. You look at someone on a bike, you look at someone on a rower, on a treadmill, even if you're swimming, it's the same repetitive movements and you're moving in one plane of motion. Now, maybe if you're running outside and you're running over boulders and you're climbing things, or maybe if you're swimming in an ocean, you have to move around or whatever. But most of the times when people do those exercises, they do them in, in stationary you know, positions or in this kind of straight line. Well, with resistance training, I'm pushing, I'm pulling, I'm twisting, I'm going laterally, I'm going uh, in the frontal plane, I'm moving backwards, I'm doing different exercises, I'm focusing on the reps. So it just requires more cognitive involvement, uh, more present cognitive involvement. So because of that, resistance training is probably one of the best forms of exercise because aside from making you healthier through the things I talked about earlier, it's also developing parts of your brain uh, or strengthening parts of the brain that have to do with movement. There was a recent study that just came out, in fact, um, and now this, this wasn't on normal people. This was on people with Alzheimer's, but they used resistance training. It was the first time I've ever seen one of these, a study like this one, and they showed that resistance training stopped the progression. This is crazy. Stopped the progression of Alzheimer's. This is the first time we've ever seen a non-drug intervention that actually stopped uh, the progression. And some of the people in the study actually looked like they were starting to uh, get better. It looked like the Alzheimer's was starting to regress a little bit. And this was from uh, resistance training. The other thing is that because resistance training promotes the, the building of lean tissue muscle, um, and muscle is a very insulin sensitive tissue. It really, when you build muscle, you, your, your, your insulin sensitivity increases and improves quite a bit. When you look at cognitive impairment issues like dementia and Alzheimer's and others, oftentimes what you find is a lot of, uh, a lot of insulin uh, insensitivity and issues with utilizing glucose. I know some, in fact, I know a lot of scientists that will even refer to Alzheimer's as type 3 diabetes. So uh, not only are you exercising your proprioceptive ability, you're being present, you're speeding up your metabolism, you're also becoming more uh, sensitive to insulin and improving your body's ability to utilize glucose, which uh, you know, could directly prevent the, the, the cognitive decline issues we see with older people as they become 
uh, more, you know, as their insulin sensitivity starts to decline. Right. I love long distance running and I know that it does make my body more efficient that's burning energy uh, there with in the long run reducing my metabolic rate possibly um, and my understanding so that's a negative of long distance running but my understanding is that there has been quite a lot of science showing that long distance running improves cognitive performance uh, over time not only acutely which i definitely feel that i'm performing better cognitively acutely so how does one incorporate long distance running into a exercise an exercise regimen uh, and avoid the problem of the the long recovery period that is required after such a uh, such a long run that uh, i feel uh, great after because after i do have a long run then uh, i often need several days to recover and that doesn't allow me to get the volume of strength training in that i'd like to so how does one incorporate uh, long distance running into a uh, weekly program of strength training Right. Okay. So I, I want to be very clear. Uh, all forms of, of exercise and activity ap applied appropriately will have improvements on cognitive function and health overall. Now running, long distance running in particular, is the, the original ancient, probably the most, um, the form of activity that we evolved to do the most. Uh, so to be very clear, when you look at humans uh, physically, right, we're known for our intelligence, we're the great tool makers, right? But when you look at humans physically, really there's only one thing that we do really well, which is run for long, for distance. We don't do anything else on, and throw with accuracy. That's it. Throw with accuracy, run for distance. Other than that, we're terrible in comparison to other animals. But when you're looking at running for distance, humans can outrun uh, most animals um, for, for not for speed, but just for distance. And this is probably how we hunted. We probably would, you know, throw a spear at an animal, injure it or, or not, and just chase it down until it got tired um, and then uh, killed it. And we, we've actually observed this in modern hunter-gatherers. So running is a great form of exercise. The problem with running is that, uh, you know, for most of human history, we evolved running since we could walk. Uh, we, we did it all the time. It's a, it's a skill, just like anything. And, and when you don't do it, you lose that skill. So the problem, and I'm sure you encounter this, when the average person, the average adult says, I'm going to start running, because they just didn't do it since they were children, um, they don't take the time to really learn the skill of running, which can take a, take a while. And you see a higher injury rate. Um, and so there's all these shoes designed to offset the imbalances and all that other stuff. But if you're somebody that can run well, running is exceptional. The other drawback to running is you have to do it. It takes a lot of time. Unlike resistance training where I could do 35, 45 minutes twice a week and get, you know, the results I was looking for. Uh, running is best done fre frequently. You know, if you just ran once a week, you definitely get some results. But where you really get the results of running is when you can do it relatively frequently. All right. Now let's go back to what your question was, which, which had to do with recovery. Number one, uh, I would limit the, um, the, the distance of my runs so that I don't feel so wasted afterwards. Now, there's nothing wrong with testing yourself. You may want to limit that to once a week. The rest of your runs should leave you feeling uh, vibrant and good because if you push yourself that hard all the time to where you need a few days just to recover, um, then sure, you're exercising your mental capacity for you know punishment and whatnot but your body will start to break down you start to develop you start to produce a lot of oxidative stress um, and you can actually notice just uh, over time you start to get some health issues uh, as a result so number one I would say reduce the intensity or the, or, or the duration of running so that for the for the most part not always you can you can always test yourself once a week or so but for the most part when you run after you're done yeah you felt like you run you're a little tired but you're not totally wasted the second thing I would say is to fuel your body uh, properly. Uh, make sure you eat adequate uh, carbohydrates. 
Um, and proteins, for sure. Runners that I've worked with tend to focus on the carbs and forget about the proteins. And, uh, you know, a high-protein diet is very uh, good for recovery and repair. Um, so make sure you have a good diet, um, and, you know, especially after uh, the run to replenish glycogen and to, to kickstart the recovery process. You can also try, if you do push yourself a little too hard and you're like, wow, I'm going to be you know, I'm going to be wasted for, you know, a few days. Mm -hmm. uh, sauna use has been shown to have uh, a lot of effect on recovery. Ice baths uh, have also been shown to have uh, a lot of beneficial effects uh, for recovery. So you can try doing those two things. As far as resistance training is concerned, if you're, if you love running and you do a lot of running, then the goal is to use resistance training to augment, right? To, to benefit oh. your running. In that case, once a week of resistance training is plenty. You don't need any more than that. Once a week, 45 minutes. I would do maybe three, two or three big foundational movements. And then I would do three or four correctional exercise type movements. And, and those would be based off of your own movement patterns. You know, um, typically with runners, I need to work on core stability, ankle and hip mobility, uh, maybe some soft tissue work. Just to really augment, uh, you know, the, the 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 miles and stuff that you're putting on uh, your body with running. Now, in in response to the metabolism uh, comment, there's nothing wrong with having an efficient metabolism. Uh, uh, your meta if it naturally slows down because you run more, um, or you eat less, or both, or you speed it, you know, there's nothing wrong with a slower metabolism so long as you're healthy. Now, if your metabolism slows down because of you know disease or whatever, that's different. But if you're healthy and your metabolism slows down, there's nothing wrong with it. The only reason why I, I tell people that you probably want to speed up your metabolism is because it just works better for, for, the, for modern life. You know, you, you're a lot, you can eat more. Um, mm, but if yeah. you don't have a problem, if you don't have a problem with, with diet, and you, you, you eat adequately and you're like, I don't need to eat more. I'm fine. I'm happy. And I, I, you know, I don't mind the, 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 the efficiency that my metabolism is developing for money. Perfectly fine. Perfectly healthy. Nothing wrong with it. So... I think sometimes get people get a little confused when we talk about the metabolism and they think, oh, no, I'm slowing metabolism down. That's inherently a bad thing. It's not. It's just for the average person, when their metabolism slows down, that tends to contribute to obesity because they just want to eat more food. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. You mentioned two, two, three times a week earlier for maintenance of strength. And now you mentioned one uh, time a week. Of Once a week. Yeah, once uh, a week strength. if you're doing a, yeah. if you're doing a lot of running um, and that's your main form of exercise, once a week is plenty because you're augmenting mm -hmm. your running. I, when I talked about two days a week, that was for the average person who just wants to do some exercise to improve their health. They don't have much time to spend in the gym. So two days a week resistance training, that would be it. Right. What's your take on interventions that aren't evidence-based because there hasn't been enough research conducted yet and I'm thinking specifically about most of the supplements except for maybe creatine and fish oil and caffeine well you know um, okay so I have a, I have two uh, seemingly conflicting thoughts about that so one some supplements don't have a ton of scientific study but they've been used for hundreds or oftentimes thousands of years in other cultures or forms of medicine or performance enhancement. And when they've been used for a thousand years in, let's say, Chinese medicine for a particular thing, that's a long, long history, a lot of anecdotes. And I will weigh that uh, as high as scientific study. So if I, if I, if I know that in Chinese medicine that they, for example, they use uh, ginseng uh, for certain situations, you know, increased vitality, for example, in, in, in men with low, low symptoms of vitality, and it's been used for, you know, 2,000 years, um, then that to me is, that's great evidence. It's been used for a long time. It's a lot of anecdote. Um, so that I'm okay with. The supplements that don't have any history, uh, the ones that, you know, they invent or create, and then there's no scientific study. Um, I'd say buyer be, beware. You know, you, you'll be able to read some anecdote on your Amazon reviews and whatever, but they haven't been used for very long. 
or observed for very long. We don't have scientific study done on them. You should probably be careful. Um, and, and the third thing is listen to your body. If you start using something and you start noticing, you know, different effects, don't stubbornly stick to the supplement just because the, the, the product tells you it's good for you. If it doesn't feel right, stop taking it. But you should definitely buyer beware with that kind of stuff because uh, you, oftentimes people do themselves more harm than good. Right. Yeah. I think so too, and I think that what you mentioned about listening to your body is very important. And I think it's a, it's a pity that we don't have more science on all of these supplements so that we can distinguish what works from what doesn't. And that's actually something that we're trying to help solve with our application through enabling people to log their experiences online so that we can get a lot of data on how people experience the effects of different supplements. Oh, very cool. So I have a question for you regarding your podcast and YouTube content as well. Sure. How do you effectively and accurately communicate science in those media? Well, um, if I'm talking to, so we, we try to reach a general audience and I think we've done a pretty good job, uh, with doing that, you know, uh, when we started the, our, 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 our business and our podcast, we had no experience in any media whatsoever. None of us ever did a podcast or YouTube or video or, or any of that stuff. But we did have uh, decades of experience coaching and training uh, everyday people, what you would refer to as general, general population. And through that, you know, those decades of working with them, you learn how to be effective as a trainer. And, and really what you learn is how to communicate what you're trying to communicate. Um, a, a, a bad way of communicating something would be just to cite, believe it or not, would be just to cite a study and tell somebody something works. Um, that really doesn't work for most people. It works for some people, but it doesn't work for most people. So you have to learn how to communicate things, how to, to give, how to tell stories and anecdotes and and how, what to say, when to say it, and what not to say. Um, and that's a very, it, it takes a long time to do that. So when we started the podcast, we had no media experience, but we had all this experience communicating fitness to the average person. And so we did very well early on. Even, but if you listen to us early on, you'll hear we had no media experience. We're terrible on the podcast. But when we would communicate, you know, uh, how to eat better, how to exercise, how to start, you know, mo what motivation, you know, what its value is, what its value isn't, you know, that kind of stuff. We did very well because we, we re you know, through trial and error, through two decades of training clients, you know, we realized what worked and what didn't work. So I'll, I'll give you a simple example. One of the more common challenges or issues people will, will have with fitness is that they, they'll have, uh, they don't have much time. Uh, or at least they, they, they perceive that they don't have much time to commit to exercise. So somebody would come to me and say, you know, I want to work out, but I'm really busy. I don't have a lot of time. Now, the, the, the early trainer or somebody who, who doesn't have experience communicating this, they may, something, they may say something along the lines of, you know, everybody has 24 hours in a day. We all have the same amount of time. You have to prioritize your health. It's the most important thing. It's, it's, you have to put it in your schedule and make it important because your good health contributes to everything else. So it's very important and you need to motivate yourself and blah, 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 blah. Okay. All of those things are correct, but super ineffective, super ineffective. That conversation right there never works long term. Either the person feels like you don't understand me or my life, or the person says, yeah, okay, you're right. I'm going to try and get motivated and do all this stuff and then they don't stick to it because they, they, they committed to something that was just too much for them uh, at that moment now the experienced version of myself the person who through years of learning what works and what doesn't work would say something like this um oh yeah a lot of people are busy you're right it's very difficult to find time to exercise what is an amount of time that you know right now you can realistically and what I mean by realistically, something you could stick to forever, realistically dedicate to exercise. Like right now, knowing your schedule, what do you think you can commit to? 
And nine out of ten times, the person will give you a number. And it may be, I can do one hour once a week. Or I think I can do two 30-minute workouts a week. Or something like that. Then I would say, perfect. We are going to design a workout around the time that you know you can commit. So you can only come once a week. Not a problem. It's much better than doing nothing. You're actually going to get some strength gains, and I can, I can construct a workout that will be as effective as possible within that time frame. So let's work within that. Far, far, far more effective, a much, much more effective way of communicating. Now, I know as a trainer that when I got that person to, to do that once a week that they said that they can do and that they felt was realistic, and I got them to stay consistent, and I showed them some progress over time, again, nine out of ten times, that person would then themselves, without me even saying anything, slowly increase the amount of days and time that they can work out. They slowly themselves would find more time because they started slowly and they can see the benefits and they can see the value. So that's just a simple example of, of, of you know, how to communicate a little bit more effectively. All right. Where can our listeners find you online? So if you want to find me personally... Uh, I'm on Instagram most most often, uh, and my page is Mind Pump Sal. If you want to find the podcast, that's where myself and my two co-hosts uh, talk about fitness and health, and uh, you know we talk about current events and studies and all that stuff. Um, you want to go to Mind Pump, which is on any podcast platform, iTunes, Spotify, um, and any others. Um, and then if you want free information, if you just want to read some free information on how to get leaner, uh, you know, how to build muscle, how to improve your squat, the best exercises for your midsection and so on, we have quite a bit, you can go to mindpumpfree.com and then you can download everything that we have there for free. It doesn't cost you a dime. All right. We'll link to all of those sources in the show notes. And thank, thank you. you, Sal, for coming on the Neutralize podcast. No problem. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Neutralize podcast. Please remember to not take anything that we said as professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. For an evidence-based, personalized nootropic recommendation, go to beta.neutralize.com. That's B-E-T-A dot N-O-O-T-R-A-L-I-Z-E dot com.